so we're here on another episode of Wednesday Wisdom, and we're here with our sales rep, Eric. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what animal you're going to be talking about? Um, I keep a lot of different reptiles, and I definitely enjoy all of them. Um, I work down in the Florida area as the sales rep for ZooMet. So um, I'm going to be speaking mostly about some skinks, blue tongue skinks, and then other Australian skinks that maybe if you have a blue tongue, you might be interested in looking more into. They're underappreciated yeah. species. Yeah, or rare people haven't seen before because you might not see them in most pet shops. Well, blue tongue skinks are really nice. That They're just very tame, naturally pretty tame for most of the varieties, especially the Australian varieties of blue tongue skinks. They live a long time. They're easy to take care of. Um, they can be pretty well, you know, good to handle. And um, just, I think blue tongue skinks are gonna continue to get more popular as pets um, in the next many years, so. Um, and then the other species I'm gonna talk about are kind of a little different in that they they can be kept in groups and they have kind of family groups and things. They're also an Australian skink, so that's the Agurnia group. So with blue tongue skinks, you see a lot of Indonesian varieties, the gigas complex of blue tongues that are in most of pet shops right now. And a lot of those are imports. And so they're okay pets, but they require a lot more care, a lot higher humidity, a lot of different things in their overall care. They get a little bit bigger. Um, a lot of the Australian blue tongue skinks, such as northern blue tongue skinks and some of the easterns, um, actually will end up making better pets long term. So I think they're going to become more popular uh, in years to come as the breeders can produce more. They look pretty similar though, right? But their care requirements are different? They, yeah. Yeah, they can look a little similar to the untrained eye, but there's a lot of there's a lot of variables. Um, a lot of the Indonesians are more banded. They get bigger. Uh, they require higher humidity. Um, they have a bigger range in diet in terms of you know foraging more on on different uh, like diets like we make. Um, and a lot of the Australian varieties they stay a little bit smaller. They're all captive bred. Um, and then they've been captive bred for so many generations, you're starting to see different morphs popping out. Um, okay. So guys are line breeding for whites or sunsets and sunrises and uh, yeah, different white outcrosses. So that's kind of exciting. Okay. You generally would set them up pretty simple. You'd have a, a either under tank heat pad or a heat end at one side that gets up to about 90, 95, somewhere in there. Um, you'll use usually a forest floor type substrate, you know, cypress. Um, that way it can handle a little bit of humidity if it's in Indonesian, or you can keep it on the drier side with the same substrate. Um, their diets are very highly varied. They like to scavenge in the wild, so they eat fruits, vegetables, a lot of proteins. Um, so they love snails in the wild. That's one of their favorites. So can of snails is a great thing for blue tongues, uh, really good lean meat. Um, and. Yeah, they grow pretty fast, so it's really important if you get baby blue tongue skinks to give a lot of calcium in the diet. Um, so they have good bone health yeah, while they're growing. Yeah, calcium with D3 is usually what you're going to want to use, especially kept indoors. Almost everybody keeps their blue tongue skinks indoors. And um, most of the breeders are starting now to use UVB lighting. In the past, people didn't, um, they but they're seeing. Okay without it in the past. They seem to do okay, but you have to be more careful on your supplementation. Extra calcium with D3 and multivitamins in the diet mixed in because they don't really like it if it's just sprinkled on top. You want to mix it in the foods. Um, but yeah, they're doing one of the tricky things about blue tongue skinks is trying to breed them because um, they're kept usually always singly, you know, individual animals, one per cage. So trying to figure out the sex of your blue tongue skink can be challenging and then breeding them. It's not uh, not for everybody. Why is that difficult? Um, they just have to be cycled right. And again, depending on the species of blue tongues, it can be um, Indonesians are much harder to breed consistently. The Australians that have been bred in captivity for many more generations are doing a lot better, but they have to be cycled just right. And what do you mean by that cycling? Like, uh, they have the to right have a cooling. Stuff? Yeah, right seizing. So they have to know that um, they, they have to have been um, conditioned for the same time to be ready to breed because the female won't just breed to any male, the male won't just breed to any female. And it's harder yeah. to tell if, if it's been successful too, right, because they uh, give live birth, right? Right, right, exactly. So yeah, so they have to have been, um, they have to both be ready to breed at the same time. So if they weren't cycled properly in the same area, 
the male might be ready to breed three weeks before the female's ready to breed and then it just doesn't work for the year. So, um, but yeah, because they're live birth, they breed and um, you don't really know if they've taken always. And so a lot of times you don't get babies, but they make really good pets and they're gonna continue to get more popular, especially with the Northern blue tongue skink morphs that are getting bred and yeah, they make good pets. Would you say that they're a similar temperament for like handability as like bearded dragon or? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. They definitely are. Uh, one of the things when you go to hold a blue tongue skink is don't just come at it to the face. You know, you want to come from the side and scoop underneath and then they're really good. They get to a big size. So, you know, kind of like a bearded dragon is sometimes a little heavier where they're, they're, they're a good size and they're, they're hardy and they live a long time too. That's another thing with blue tongue skinks. Usually they can live 25 to 30 years, which is a long time. So that's, that's another reason I think they're going to get more popular. There's something that I really enjoy keeping, and one of the things uh, that's neat about them is that Agurnia skinks, which is a group of skinks from Australia and also Indonesia, um, they usually live communally. Um, so they'll have one rock outcrop or tree, and then you'll have the parents and the babies growing up in the same same um, you know environment, which is pretty cool. So when you're keeping an animal like a blue tongue skink that's solitary, one per cage. Then going from that to something like a spiny tail skink, like a Gigi skink, is one of the Gurnias that I really enjoy keeping. Um, I can have them have babies in a cage. I can keep them together in a cage, um, and then, and then attack the babies. no, and they can grow up with the babies for a year. Some people separate the babies quickly. Um, I leave them in for a while, and they they bask on the head of the mom, and it's really neat. Um, some of the differences between them and a blue tongue skink is they um, they have really spiky. Um, scales, especially on the tail, on the Gigi skinks, uh, which is a Gurnia stokesi. And it is, um, it's a pretty big skink and they like to bask, they like UV, they eat a whole lot of greens, they have a varied diet, they do like more bugs than a blue tongue skink would. And, um, so they're more yeah. meat yeah, kind of. They're, they're not as much of a scavenger, so they like more insects and then also greens. They love flowers, they like um, different fresh greens, different like tortoise diets, things like that. So yeah, they're, they kind of eat almost anything, including crested gecko diets and things, yeah. um, which is kind of fun. But one of the things that's just mostly interesting about them is that the, the communal aspect, the family groups, is just really fun. And they live a long yeah. time as well. Yeah, for sure. There's many species of agurnia. Okay. I don't know how many exactly, but probably upwards towards the twenties. Um, there's some that get as big. Or there's bigger, some that get big. Or... Yeah, the okay. king agurnia king eye is a big long one. Uh, then there's the gidges, which is the one that I keep mostly, which is about this size. Um, and then there's the Depressa group, which is another spiny tail um, group of skinks that stays way smaller. Adult males might be this big. Okay. Um, instead of having six to eight babies or, you know, Gigi skinks usually average between about three and six babies, but the smaller ones only average one to two babies, sometimes three for a big litter. Okay. So, But the colors are all over the place and they split that group of skinks into many a few years ago, so it's kind of exciting. We can probably show some pictures of some yeah, of those. Yeah, we'll pop some pictures yeah. here. Very cool. <laughs> but yeah, they're fun things. So those are similar. So those are basically like a skink family then? Oh yeah, they're okay. all skinks, yeah. Yeah, just walking by the cage and seeing a mom and dad basking under the light with four babies dog piled on its head, you know, is one of the coolest things. Yeah, and really there's very <laughs> few reptiles that you can keep babies growing up in the cage with adults. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, if anyone has questions for Eric, write them in the comments.